Hi guys, uh, I recognize a few of you. Uh, and those of you who haven't seen, hello, I'm, I'm Camiar. Together with uh, Thomas Rollet, uh, we're Batman and Robin, uh, co-directors co of the King's Entrepreneurship Lab. And um, to those of you online, uh, great, to, great to have you and thank, thanks for joining us. So this is our actually monthly uh, speaker series, a monthly event. I hope you can come to the, to the, uh, to the other ones too. This is our third in, our, in this series. And we're super excited to have uh, Jago McKenzie here to tell us a little bit about careers in startups and his journey and his experience. And um, he thought he was going to get away lightly. And we got uh, Sharina from the judge. So you, some of you might uh, recognize and most of you might probably know who's going to be grilling him. Are you going to do a little bit of grilling? Uh, you're ready. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll, and, um, and afterwards, uh, don't, don't disappear. We, we can catch up with uh, other people and uh, Jago and Trina and everybody else there. Okay, thanks so much. Have a good evening. Fantastic. Can you guys hear us okay? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, my name is Trina. As Tony said, I work for a small and really grateful that Jago has given us this evening to come and have a chat with us. Today's through the open, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, and yeah, let's just have a really good discussion about the your journey beforehand, also what you're doing now and kind of how you see the business and where it's going. Um, so I guess the first thing I want to ask you is please introduce yourself. Sure, thanks very much. Um, so firstly, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, so I am Jago. I am currently working at a company called Remitly. So Remitly is a global fintech company um, that provides financial services that's targeted towards migrants. So it was founded in Seattle uh, almost a decade ago now. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. So it's founded in, in Seattle almost a decade ago now. Um, and it started with cross-border money transfers. So targeting, especially in the US, for example, migrants sending from the US to the Philippines or the US to Nigeria or the US to India and Mexico and so on. Um, and then it expanded quite quickly uh, out of the US into Canada. And then it started in, in Europe in, in 2018. And so I joined Remitly in 2019 just when it started its, its international expansion in, in Europe and then throughout Asia. So I currently work as head of region at Remitly for a few of the, the SEN countries, which means I have PNL ownership um, to ultimately have the remit to, to grow these regions. Uh, so that's the UK, Ireland, and the Nordics, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And so as part of that, I work across multiple functions. So pricing, marketing, product, customer service, and so on to create a, an end-to-end -end product that, that customers love uh, that they keep on coming back to so that we grow, grow, grow the regions. Um, and then I also have a, a second hat at, at Remitly, which is I sit on the pricing side. So we have a, a fundamental challenge, which is we effectively have over a thousand markets at Remitly. And that's because we classify each uh, customer sending from a certain country to a received country as a different market. And so, for example, the UK to the Philippines or the UK to Nigeria, we would classify as two separate markets. And so from a pricing standpoint, that's incredibly difficult as pricing is obviously key for our, our cross-border money transfer service. And to scale that effectively to a thousand markets is really, really tough. And this is something we're increasingly coming up now, uh, now that we're getting towards scale. So the second half I wear is working very closely on the pricing side, which is looking at our, our pricing strategy and how we scale our pricing over the next few years so that we can operate effectively in, in a thousand markets. Thanks for that. And Prior to your time at Remitly, so what does your background look like and what you've got? Very corporate background um, before I joined Remitly. I did my undergrad at Bristol and I studied economics and management. And then in my second year at Bristol, I did a summer internship at a strategy consulting by PwC and became a strategy and which is now the strategy arm of PwC. So I did a, a summer internship in my second year of university. And then I joined as a graduate. Um, and so I spent around four years in, in consumer goods and automotive companies uh, before I saw the light and I jumped over to the, the startup world. With and how did you? Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so um, I love these big innovations. Um, so just wondering how did you first get introduced to Remitly? Yeah, so when I was in strategy consulting, one, one of the reasons I joined is, is I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it's a way of kicking that decision down the road by a few years. And it keeps... 
And then as I progressed with consulting, I began to get a little bit tired of, I think, the normal things. Uh, the hours are quite long and very unpredictable. Uh, client work can be quite stressful sometimes. The travel gets tiring very quickly. Um, but also I, I felt like I was creating a lot of PowerPoint slides and a lot of advisory work, but not actually executing on, on anything. So I began thinking about moving on because consulting keeps so many doors open to you. And I was scared about closing off some doors and going into a, a different industry because consulting was, was all I knew. Um, so I thought I wanted to do an MBA. Okay. And then I got MBA sponsorship from my firm. And I started doing the GMAT and I started doing the applications. And I realized I had zero motivation personally for an M MBA, but <laughs> I did want to have a break from consulting. So then I started talking with one of the partners who I was very close with and was one of my mentors in, in consulting around doing a secondment, which for me was a way of testing the waters, seeing what a different company was like, seeing if I would, if I would enjoy it and leaving consulting. And that very evening, he got emailed through um, by someone called Eleanor, who was the head of international at Remitly, and she was also a Booz alumnus. And he said, anyone who might want to join for a few months at this fast growing company, which had just launched in Europe. So I did a three months of comment at Remitly, uh, which was testing the waters. Um, and I remember being quite worried about would I be able to add any value? Would my consulting skills at PP generalist, would I be seen as just the PowerPoint guy? Mm -hmm. um, and what I found is, is I loved it. I had an amazing time and all my fears were, were completely unfounded. And so then at the end of that three months of comment, Remitly offered me a full-time role. Um, and so I joined that, that following summer. It was a very easy decision for me. Perfect. So give us a bit of a picture how many people were working at Remitly by the time you joined and what has it grown to now? So when I joined the international business, we were around 10 people. Um, I think 10 people and a dog uh, in the wow. office. Uh, <laughs> what was the dog's name? I actually can't remember. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the dog's name. I'm not very good at dogs. Okay. <laughs> um, but we were 10 people and a dog in a smallish office in Victoria um, with meeting rooms where you could hear each other through the walls and half the meeting rooms didn't have air conditioning. One of the meeting rooms had our printer in it. And so you'd be interrupted all the time by people printing out documents. <laughs> And then, and, and we just launched in Europe. So we were still finding product market fit. We were still looking for scale. And since then, so that was two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, we've gone from 10 to well over hundred people now in the international business. So we have sites in, in London, in Krakow, in Cork, and then dotted around um, Europe and, and also in Singapore. Um, and within the next year or a couple of years, it will probably more than double again. So very, very rapid growth in, in a very short period of time in terms of the number. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, I don't want to say the C word, but how was it sort of joining a startup at the beginning of COVID and kind of working with them and, and just kind of navigating what we've had happen for the last few years? Yeah, so, so COVID obviously had a, I mean, a big impact on, on everyone. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's been untouched by COVID, um, and especially on our, on our customer base, because many of our customers, all of our customers are migrants. And so many of them are, are firstly working in often service level jobs. Um, which were the first to shut down. And so many of our customers, unfortunately, would have lost their, their jobs, but also migration was completely curtailed. And so you didn't have that inflow and outflow of migrants that, that you normally have. And so the, the customer base did, did shift slightly. Um, but then there have also been quite significant fintech, especially trends, which were completely accelerated by, by COVID. So there has been a, a gradual shift to digital over the past few years, but it was actually, especially within remittances, fairly slow. And so a lot of um, our potential customers would still have been using offline Western Union stores, going in in person, giving away cash um, and sending money in cash rather than using a digital equivalent, equivalent like us. And with lockdown, all of that offline base completely shut down. So immediately, almost overnight, there was a complete shift to digital, which happened in, in remittances, but also happened in the wider fintech sector. And so it massively accelerated that shift to digital and brought it forward by, by many, many years in a effectively a once in a generation event. Um, and so the, the growth rates we saw before and after COVID were, were really, really significant. And then on top of that, lockdown had the impact of lots of um, people operating digital marketing pulled out. So we acquire a lot of our customers through Google, through Facebook, through Android, through iOS, through, through digital marketing campaigns. And we compete in that through something called auctions. So everyone who's playing with a digital marketing will put in a price, put in a bid, 
And so if more people are competing, the price goes up, it gets more expensive to, to effectively acquire customers. And with COVID, the, the cost of digital marketing fell through the floor. And so we were able to spend more money on digital marketing because we could acquire customers at a more effective and more efficient payback. And so that, in addition to the overall shift to digital, meant that we saw really, really strong growth rates um, over the COVID lockdown, as did I think most of fintechs, which is now obviously starting to curtail now that people are, are moving back. But I think it's, a, for me at least, I, my, my hypothesis is it's a permanent shift because once you've moved online to a digital platform, it's unlikely you're going to move back to the offline one. And it's a little bit, I think, like Netflix and Blockbuster. Once you've discovered Netflix, you're unlikely to go back to the Blockbuster type model. And so it was, it was a once in a generation shift um, COVID, I think, for, for all of people. Yeah, thank you for that insight. And I'm sure a lot of our questions later might kind of touch on that again. Um, but kind of going back to, you were talking about how the business grew from you know, starting with 10 people. Is any of that original founding team still with Remitly? and talk to us a little bit about culture as well as the organization, how that's changed as it's been scaling. Yes, so out of, out of those 10 people, I think four are still with Remitly and, and six have moved on. Um, and those four have all grown with Remitly and all progressed as, as Remitly's grown and, and all doing really, really interesting roles now. But there are people who move on and, and the company changes quite significantly. Um, and so in terms of how the company has changed over, over those couple of years, I think in some ways it stayed very similar. Um, there is a very big emphasis on culture at Remitly. And one of the learnings, so we have three co-founders, Matt, Josh, and, and Shabazz. And Josh, before he founded Remitly, founded a company called Shelfari, which he then sold to Amazon um, back in 2010 or something like that. And one of his learnings from Shelfari was the importance of culture. So day one of Remitly, or very early days before there were almost any employees, Matt, Josh, and Shabazz got into a room and sketched out the cultural values they want for Mitley to embody. And so it came from very early days that these are the cultural values. And then as Mitley has scaled and grown, it's kept quite consistent with those values. So I think in some ways, the culture has stayed fairly unchanged. Um, but in other ways, of course, it's changed massively. I mean, the company going from, from 10 people to, to well over 100, teams get built out, processes get built out. Things are very, very different. But there are also lots of similarities that I can see. Can you share some of those cultures with us? Sure. So there are a lot of uh, cultural uh, attributes that the remit has. I think there are sort of 15 or 16 or something like that. The three which, which are, are some of the most important and which I think everyone really embodies. Um, the first one is customer centricity. And customer centricity is something every company wants. Um, they want to have a product that customers really love. But I think especially at a company like Remitly, it's really, really critical because we have over a thousand markets. And so understanding that customer behavior is really, really difficult. And on top of that, our customers are, are migrants. And so for example, I'm personally not a, not a migrant. And so some of the hypotheses I might have might not be what our customers actually want. Something that's been consistent at Remitly, which I think has driven a lot of the growth um, because we try and make any changes in, in mind of what the customer wants. Um, the second one, which I think is important is empathetic partnership. And this is something which I didn't uh, fully appreciate when I was at consulting, uh, which attracts a, maybe a certain kind of person. Um, but at Remit, because we're now a global company um, with multiple time zones, having Zoom meetings, you're not necessarily meeting in person. Being just a nice person to work with who's happy to help out others um, is something that's pushed very hard and, and I think is important as a company grows so quickly. Um, and then the first one is data driven. So, we are a fintech business. We have a lot of data going through us. And especially with remittances, the external data is not very good. Um, it's a very opaque business. And so using our data to make decisions and bring that back to the customers is, um, for me, very, very important. And what was it like going through an IPO? Um, so, so remit the IPO in, in September. Um, and we IPO'd, I think the valuation was around $7 billion or so, uh, just over $7 billion um, I, I, on the NASDAQ in, in the US. And so when a company prepares, when a company, especially like Remit, prepares for an IPO, there are a lot of things that go on in the background. And to get a, a fast growing company is really hard. And so there is a lot of work on, on team separate compliance and finance and so on to get our, our systems and our processes into a, a mature state so that we can IPO. 
Um, so that is a significant amount of work. From an employee standpoint, it's very opaque. So there were rumors ahead that we might IPO and we could obviously see the size that the company was getting to. Um, and we saw there were news articles around when we might IPO, but there are also news articles that other companies might IPO. And then they don't or it gets pushed back. It's, it's a very um, uncertain environment. And so the rumors got more and more. And then the first we really knew about it was when we submitted the 409A statement, which is effectively a public prospectus that you have to submit with the We only learned that we would actually IPO, I think, a few days before. Um, so incredibly uncertain. We didn't know what price it would IPO at. We learned with the market when it was published. And then I remember the, the IPO day. Unfortunately, we couldn't fly over to the US because of the, the COVID restrictions, which is obviously a shame. Um, but we got to see the event live. We were at the NASDAQ opening bell, uh, and then we had a, a party afterwards. So yeah, it was very uncertain, quite nerve wracking, obviously a very important moment for, for many people in, in, in remitly. And then the challenge after IPO is not, at least for me, not to get too fixated on it. It's very easy to look at the stock price. It's very easy to think about what the IPO means. Um, but I think day to day things that we haven't changed. We're still trying to grow the company. We're still trying to create the best product we can for our customers. And so the IPO is obviously a critical event for remitly. Um, but I think it's also important not to get too distracted by the, by the process. Fantastic. And some of us in the room either want to work in startup or have startup. Um, kind of what advice would you give to those that are thinking about joining startups? Like it, it seems like it's all gone well for you. It's all gone well. Yeah. So if I, if I look back to what I was nervous about in consulting, I was firstly nervous that there wasn't a clear path to joining a startup, um, especially at undergrad. Um, most people went on to do investment banking or consulting or accountancy or asset management or something like that. There was no clearly defined path for, for how to join and how to find a startup. I was nervous around, would I be able to add value? Um, a startup by its nature is very uncertain. Um, and I was coming from quite a corporate role. role. So I was, I was worried about how much value I'd be able to add in, in such an uncertain um, environment. Uh, and then I was also worried about closing too many doors. Um, so consulting, the reason I joined is it keeps doors open. And I was worried about going to a startup, which might fail uh, very shortly afterwards, uh, getting too specialized and closing doors. And my learnings is, is firstly, all of those fears were, were completely unfounded. Um, so especially in a, in a very early stage startup or when, it, when it's very small, you have to be a bit of a generalist and you have to work across different functions because those functions aren't built up. And so having that generalist skill set was actually a big asset for that, as you are quite scrappy and you're able to work across different, different functions. Um, I was also worried about shutting too many doors, um, but then I, I didn't appreciate at the time the, the, the benefit of getting really under the skin of an industry and really seeing th things through to, to execution. Um, and then the final thing, which, which I don't think I, I fully appreciated at the time, was the importance of a startup's culture and a startup's mission um, to how much you overall enjoy. So in consulting, or I think in many corporate environments, you don't necessarily recognize the, the company's mission and you want the company to succeed, but it might not really resonate with you. Whereas with a startup, if you can find one where the mission really resonates with you, that provides a, a huge amount of day-to-day -day motivation, uh, which for me is, is one of the reasons I, I keep that remitly, um, but I didn't appreciate before, before I joined. And what things from your consultancy job and then moving into the startup were you like, quite impressed that they were quicker at doing or different at doing in terms of their structure and their processes? So remitly, when I started with 10 people, didn't really have much of a structure or processes, which is something at the time I, I really loved. Do um, they have them now? So as the company is built up, it has more processes and it has more structures, but it's still a long way from a corporate type environment. Um, so back when it was 10 people, you didn't have individual teams. Um, and so you had to do a little bit of everything. Now we do have the teams built out and so we have processes, but it's at a nice happy medium between a startup and more scale up type environment. So there are processes built out, but it's, it's nowhere like the corporate. And I guess there's sometimes people worry that going from corporate to startup, there might be a considerable um, dip in wages um, and obviously get quite used to that. Is that a myth? Is that true? And what's the difference? So I, I think it completely depends on the company. Um, and there are now startups which have a lot of funding. Um, there's a lot of funding going around. Uh, a lot of startups have raised a lot of money and are happy to pay high wages. So I, I don't think it's necessarily true 
that joining a smaller company means you have to take a different salary. Although on average, I would guess that a smaller company would, would pay less, especially if it's a small bootstrap company. Um, but, but the counter to that is, is when you join a, a startup, you're, you're potentially foregoing salary and you're potentially foregoing a, a bonus. But what you do get often is, is equity and you get options in the company. And so that gives you a, a partial ownership in, in the company. And typically you will get some sort of equity that will vest over several years. So every month you're staying at the company, you're always getting more and more equity. And when that grant runs out, then you'll be issued a new grant with, with more equity. And so that means you're, you're taking on a little bit more risk because your, your salary is potentially lower. But I think there's also more potential upside um, because you have some ownership in the company. And so if the company does well, then that, that upside can be very, very significant. Um, but also if the company doesn't do so well, then, then the upside is potentially uh, nothing. So it's kind of a risk and reward type, type ratio. Um, but I would say that the equity, especially in startups, could be quite significant. And what are the big challenges that you've seen in the fintech world? Currently going on. So, so I, I would call out a, a few challenges um, focused on, on remittances, but I, I think this is also applicable to, to broader fintech. Um, firstly, there's a lot of funding that's going around. There's a lot of competition. A lot of fintech companies are getting founded. And that leads to a challenge. I mean, competition is, is always tough. Um, it can be good, but it can also be bad. But also a lot of competitors are willing to heavily discount their products and are willing potentially to go to negative profitability and also to grow their customer base. And that's hard to compete with when, when there's so much funding going around that people are willing to discount their products so much. So I, I think the competitive landscape is, is significant. Uh, I think the second thing with, with fintech is it's really difficult to scale globally. And so if I think about which recent fintech companies have truly scaled globally, I really struggle to think of, of many recent ones. And an example that comes to mind is N26, which is a neobank, which is like in Germany. Uh, tried to come over to the UK and has pulled out, tried to go to the US and has also pulled out. Because to scale fintech across border, considering fintech is both a, a head and heart decision for many consumers, and on top of that, you've got the regulatory environment, is something that's really, really difficult. So there are fintech companies that have done well in their home markets, but then as they look to expand into other markets across the globe, that's where it gets to be really, really challenging. And now that there are many companies at that kind of scale where they're looking to expand globally, um, I think that's going to be a key challenge over, over the next few years. Fantastic. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, what's kind of next for you and where you see, you know, new positions, are you very happy in your role? And do you want to do more at Remitly? And how do you do more? So I am I'm very happy in my role at Remitly. <laughs> um, the, the things I, I'm most excited about for, for Remitly um, going forward is, I mean, there's more opportunity to scale globally. So we're live in, in Europe and in some Asian markets and also in the US, but there are many markets we haven't opened up um, from a remittance cross-border money transfer standpoint, which uh, I'm really excited to work towards opening up. Uh, there is also, I think, huge opportunity for us in new products. So we have just begun financial services. We opened a new bank in the US called Passbook last year, and we're actively looking at other financial services. And I think if you think about how many companies target financial services and migrants. Uh, I personally struggle to think of any. I think it's a really large market, which is hugely tapped. Um, and then I also think there's opportunity for Remitly in adjacent services that could use the remittance product that we've built. Mm -hmm. So the recent Novi um, a few weeks ago. And so we're providing the remittance platform for Novi. Um, they've got a pilot currently going on in Guatemala where they plug into our API and they use our cash out network in developing countries, which we've obviously built up over the past decade or so. And there are lots of other companies which would have a similar use case to, to Facebook and Novi, which could plug into our system so we could white label our product and offer remittances in adjacent industries as well. Fantastic. And can you tell us, you know, some feel good stories that you've been able to help with and remitly? Interesting and, and the mission points, um, which I find really, really satisfying and is something which I don't think I fully appreciated before I started. I was looking much more at how big can remitly be? What is the growth rate? Do I believe in the leadership and so on? And I don't think I fully appreciated how important the mission is. It's miles away from their home in order to provide money um, for their loved ones and, and their families. And so one of the things I do very regularly is I, I speak to our customers. Um, so I will pick a market and I will go through and I will phone 10 customers or 20 customers and speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. 
and hear their stories and, and hear the good and also the bad about, about what Remit Me does, does for them. And so for me, that is, that is something I find incredibly motivational and also incredibly feel good is hearing some of the stories about our customers who've traveled so far to provide for, for their loved ones. And then in some cases, Remit Me doesn't do as good a job as we could. In some cases, our product could be better. But in some cases, our customers really, really love us. Impacts the end customer is. Just wanted to open it up to the audience if you have any questions. And what we'll do is we will pop your hand up, we'll chuck one of these boxes to you, and then you can ask your question. Do you want to go first? Um, so you mentioned about um, getting equity in a startup as a substitute. So I'm assuming that you got some sort of equity at Remitly. I'm, I'm interested to know um, what advice you might have for negotiating equity when you join, because obviously the founding members aren't going to be too keen on um, giving up too much equity. So I'd, it's something I would like to do after the MBA. So I'd love to hear some advice that you might have on this. Sure. In the US, equity is now highly valued uh, and people understand uh, exactly what it could mean. And I think that's largely because there have been lots of unicorns in the US and lots of IPOs and so on. And so there have been a lot of, lot of success stories. Um, but then in the UK, at least when, I, when I'm interviewing candidates, I think relatively few people understand the value of equity. And so relatively few people will actively negotiate for equity. And so the baseline, I, I think, is slightly different to the US where it's kind of expected that you're going to negotiate for equity. In the UK, I think it'll be a little bit of a surprise, but, but taken quite well. Um, if you understand the value of equity and you're happy to negotiate. Um, it's very difficult to understand or to know what that final value of the equity will be. So if you're joining an early stage company, the equity can get diluted many times in later funding rounds. So as part of the, the equity sheet, you'll likely be giving an indicative ownership stake in the company, which, which at least for me was a very, very small uh, number of bits in, in, in Remitly. But then in subsequent funding rounds, it can go down further. It can be, it can be um, go, go down as they create more shares, um, but also it's obviously uncertain what the company is effectively going to IPO at in, in the future. So it's really hard to know how much equity you're being given and, and what the ultimate end state would be. Um, but what I would say is, I would think that many companies would be very open to negotiating, negotiating equity. And at least at, at somewhere like Remitly, if you are happy to take a further cut on the salary, go higher on the equity, that's probably something that would also be valued quite highly, both because the company is not giving up upfront cash, but also because it, it shows long-term motivation in the company um, and long-term ownership of the company. So uh, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but I think any negotiation would be well received. Uh, and I do think you can also balance it against the salary that you're, you're getting given. Sorry, this will be a more finance related question, but still. <clears throat> so when Remitly started, it was competing with a lot of big brands and banks and the established money transfer institutions. So I understand that the rates that they were offering uh, were quite competitive. So how did Remitly uh, navigate through that challenge? And now are you at a stage where you can do it sustainably without burning cash? Are you still in that, uh, or is it still you know, you're burning cash to be competitive? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. So, so remit, Remitly's cost structure is, is twofold. Um, firstly, there's a cost to us when a customer pays. So um, the payment processor will, will take a certain amount of, of money from, from that transaction, whether you pay by card or another, another method. Um, and then there is a cost on the receiving side. So there will be a cost to uh, converting the funds into a separate currency, and then also a set payout cost for the, the receiving bank or cash pickup location or, and, and so on. And you're completely correct that the smaller you are, the higher the costs. And established players have a, a strong cost base. And if I take Western Union as an example, they've got a strong cost base, but also a proprietary network, a proprietary network of cash applications. And so as a small player, it's hard to compete. What Remitly did at the very beginning is it launched one corridor at a time. So it launched in the US, but it didn't launch all of the US markets. It launched only a corridor called the US to the Philippines. So targeting explicitly Filipino migrants, sending back to the Philippines from the US. And it really focused on the single market for about two years or so. And it did that to really understand what the customer type is, to really try and tailor our product towards it, 
and they were happy, of course, to, to accept a, a short-term loss or, 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 or have difficult unit economics. And then once you scale that market, that's when you achieve better unit economics and therefore you can grow. And so after the US to the Philippine, it launched another market, which is the USA to India, and then the USA to Mexico. So it went very, very slowly through expanding every market. So it could really understand the market, create a product that's tailored towards it, and also reach enough scale so that we weren't necessarily hindered by, by being much smaller than the more established players. And obviously there was funding and, and private money, which, which helps to, to invest in the short-term product. And now we're, we're live across, as I say, over a thousand markets, and we are more at scale, um, but in some of the markets, we're, we're still under scale. And so we still have high costs. And so what we increasingly try and do now is, is we take a longer term view of what our cost structure might be. And so we're happy to invest short term if we think we're subscale and price against the longer term view of our costs so that we're not hindered by the fact that it's sort of a chicken and egg situation of uh, you have high cost because you're too small, uh, but you're too small because you have a high price. And so we take a longer term view of, of what our unit economics might be so that we are investing short term, um, but to help us achieve, achieve scale and growth. Um, there is a question from Anastasia from, from the internet, from online. Uh, you mentioned that Remitly can now integrate um, into, can be now integrated to different platforms. Is it going to be a plugin that can be incorporated to different websites as well? So I think it'll be more a very clearly defined partnership structure with certain large partners rather than a, a plug and play offering that would be incorporated in, into websites. And so because remittances are quite complex and we would want to own the whole customer journey, um, but also we'd want to be quite careful with who we're partnering with, um, considering firstly our customer base, but we want to also make sure we provide an overall high quality experience. I think we'd likely be more, more careful around partnering with a few large high quality partners and then maybe moving on to smaller ones, um, but probably not that it would be a plug and play on, on a website. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for this wonderful discussion. It was really interesting to know that Remitly focused on one single market and did the operations for two, two years, which completely goes against the current of identify and expand immediately because the competition is big. My question is slightly different. So in this entire FinTech arena and especially in the field that Remitly is in, how do you create the differential USPs for your organization versus other organizations? And how does this, uh, you know, kind of pan out in terms of the customer experience that you provide to your customers? Sure. It's a, it's a great question. And especially within remittances, it's, it's, it's hard to create differentiation. Remittances are, is, is not a generic product by any stretch of the imagination, um, but often lots of the competition seems to be just in price um, and it's sort of race to the bottom. And so it's hard to create differentiating factors to, to really separate yourself from the competition. I think lots of it comes back to localization. So if I go back to what I think made Remitly successful, very we focused on just a few markets and really understood that market and tailored its product towards that market. And that's partly tailoring the price, um, whether it's the fee or, or the FX margin you make, but also tailoring the messaging, tailoring the, the send flow, tailoring the marketing, um, tailoring the, the advertising that you do all towards this one product and building up a, a strong following within that sort of community or that diaspora. Um, and so that was successful for, for Remitly because it could tailor its product to, to a localized way. And so as Remitly has scaled, I would argue one of the, the ways we differentiate is, is we try and localize as far as possible. So we try not to create a generic product across a thousand markets, but try to really understand the customer behavior in every market and make sure that our, our product is tailored towards these different markets, which is also, I think, a bit of a competitive moat because if you look at a thousand markets, that's also really, really hard to do. It's how to create differentiation across each of those thousand markets. Um, that targets some of the base level factors. So as we get more at scale, we can have what we call direct integrations with receiving partners um, in, in developing countries. And so they plug into our, our API. And so that means that our product is incredibly fast. In seconds or so, which competes especially against some of the smaller startup players who, who don't have the scale to, to do that. 
sorry, I came in a, a bit late. So I, I missed this and it's already been addressed. Is cryptocurrency likely to be a disruption to this market? So have you already discussed that? If you have, I can watch later, but it seems likely. So, so crypto is a potential disruption uh, to the market. Uh, I, I think it's far from certain at this point. And one of the reasons Remit has partnered with, with, with Novi, um, with, with Facebook, is that um, it gives you a, a seat at the table um, for, for a potential crypto disrupt, disruption if it, if it does happen. Um, crypto, our customers run back. So a lot of our customers will pick up cash on the receiving side in a, a corner shop or a post office or, or something similar to that. And so if I look at the potential for crypto to disrupt customers who are completely unbanked, I mean, of course it can come and, and things change quickly. Um, but I also think there's a, there's a long way to go for many of our customers to be able to use crypto on, on the receiving side. And then if I look at the current costs associated with crypto, um, they're more significant or they're higher than our current cost of converting money. So crypto is definitely a potential future disruption and it's something we should keep a careful eye on. Um, but I think it's a long way away from being a 100% certainty. Um, and I think there are quite major barriers to using crypto for, for true cross-border money um, rather than into a, into a bank. Thank you. Um, so you were addressing before the fact that many of these companies are um, being pushed to, to lose um, profitability in order to gain some volume in the markets uh, because of how competitive the, the industry is in fintech, but also in, in, in other industries. Um, so how would you, from a startup or from our from a, from a owner perspective, work towards pushing back some of those demands from, from funding partners or from investors and VCs, which in many cases um, prefer to see a, a company either success big or fail? Sure. So, so I, I think a lot of it comes from a real focus and understanding of what I'm going to call unit economics. Um, um, and so that's not, that doesn't mean that you're profitable immediately. It doesn't mean that you're not investing for growth, but it means that you have a, a focus and an understanding of what is the customer life cycle with you? What is their, their churn rate? What is, what is their, uh, the number of transactions they're doing? What is the revenue for transactions and so on? And so you build up a clear view of what is the typical customer lifetime value which I think you can do even with relatively little data. I mean, it obviously has assumptions built in, but I, I think you can build up a, a, a strong view on that. And therefore you can show that you're building a sustainable business. Uh, and so that again, that doesn't mean that you're not investing for growth. It doesn't mean that you're, you're short-term not losing money, um, but it does mean that you're showing people and you're showing investors and you're showing the external market that you have a, a pricing structure, which is long-term sustainable and the customers you're, you're paying to acquire will pay back within a certain time frame that you want. And my uh, hypothesis and experience with this is, is once you build up that clear view, that's something that's really appreciated by the wider market because it's not something I, I personally think many other companies do that well, is having that focus on unit economics and having that understanding of when I acquire a customer, how long will they take to pay me back? And this is why. And therefore, this is why I'm investing heavily in this market rather than this other market. And ultimately, investors want to build a company that is, is long-term sustainable and is long-term growing. So, so I think for me, that's, that's the thing I focused on, is building out that view and showing that to other people um, to show that it's something you're, you're carefully considering and thinking. Hi, um, thank you, Shago, for being here and your presentation. Um, so I have two questions if that's okay. The first question, you mentioned a lot about localization and the importance of customer centrality to the work. So I'm asking this as an anthropologist. I'm wondering how you do the work of figuring out what is demanded in local markets, what the concept is like, what kind of service you can provide. And then the second question, building a bit upon the question on crypto, do you think central bank digital currency could be a disruption to the fintech landscape given that Quite a few central banks across the globe have been working on proof of concept for cross-border payment systems um, within the past couple of years. Yeah. So, so on, on the localization point, th this is something which is one of our biggest challenges, I think, considering we operate in so many different markets, is how do you understand what customers really want, um, especially if it's say, a market you haven't launched yet or, or a market where you're very, very small in. Um, how do you understand what customers want? How do you understand 
what you can do to improve your product towards the customers and really tailor it towards them. And for our, our very largest markets, I think, I, I wouldn't say it's easy because it's not, but, but I think it's more straightforward because we have a lot of data. And so we, we can test things within the product and get a read very, very quickly. Um, and so you can quickly build up a view of what messaging works, what messaging doesn't work, what kind of products work and so on, and, and use a data-driven approach to really understand it. Where it's a smaller, um, smaller market, you can't do an A-B test, you, you, you can't test it in the same quantitative way. And so what we typically do then is, is we do a lot of surveys, we do focus groups, we do what we call labs with customers, which is where we get a, a group of customers together and we walk them through our product and, and, and they give us their, their, their thoughts on it and, and, their, and their feedback. Um, and we will also, in, in some cases, employ external agencies as well to help us with that customer research. So it, it's far less on, on big data because we just don't have it and far more on the sort of qualitative insights. And we have a, a customer insights team based in, in Seattle to help us drive some of those insights. So it's, it's something that's really, really hard. Um, I, I don't think it's easy to, by any stretch of the imagination, um, but we do focus on that. And, and a lot of it is through, as I say, testing and then also this, this sort of customer insights. Um, in terms of the, the overall crypto points, all of these things I could, could be a disruption. It's just impossible to say, I think, whether they, they will be. Um, and so I, I think it's more something that, that we should just keep an eye on um, as it develops. At the moment, uh, I don't see any, any huge indications that it's, it's a certainty, um, but these things develop so quickly that, that I think it's more something to keep an eye on rather than I'm, I'm dead certain that there is going to be a big disruption in the market. Thank you. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about Kind of back to that group of 10 or so when you joined, kind of what the background of the other members of the team were. You spoke a bit about the benefits of being a generalist, but I imagine that given the nature of the business, you also had people who were quite specialized in regulatory or in tech. And so I'm just kind of curious what the overall make of the team at that stage. Sure. So I was, when I joined, I was, I think, the only generalist or one of the only generalists, um, at least from a consulting background. So the others, the, the founding member of International was um, legal, he's, he's a lawyer. And so he set up remotely in his bedroom, um, and he was the one who negotiated the, the licensing, uh, which at the time gave us access to Europe, but obviously subsequently we unfortunately had to get additional European licenses. Um, but he also uh, negotiated the bank partnerships, um, so, so we had a partnership um, with the bank to store the funds, um, the remittance funds, um, and so he was the key founding member of, of international, uh, the legal and the regulatory side. And then as, as remotely grew, the other team members that, that were quickly recruited before me was compliance. So compliance is obviously critical for any fintech, but I think especially for us, there's a big danger of money laundering, terrorist financing, stolen cards, and so on. Um, and so we recruited a, a finance expert. And then in addition to that, it was marketing. Uh, marketing was recruited quite quickly because otherwise, how do you, how do you scale without significant marketing support? And then analysts, um, a data analyst. Um, and then one other, one or two other generalists as well. So a lot of it was on, on the legal side and the compliance side, the regulatory side, then marketing. And then as we've scaled further, the focus has been on building out the analytical capability more and more, as that's obviously critical for us to, to test and learn, um, building out marketing and then also building out the pricing capability. Great. Would anyone like to say something? started at Remitly was one of the reasons I joined. It's, it's partly the, the people I, I really admired. I admired the leadership team, um, but I also really admired the founders um, because they, I mean, they built up a company from, from nothing uh, into something quite significant, which I think is amazing. Um, but also their skill sets are so different um, and they're all three such different people. So we have three co-founders at Remitly. Um, so Josh, Matt, and Shavas. Shavas uh, was a technical co-founder. Uh, so he's currently a software engineer, uh, still within the business. And then Matt and Josh, Matt is currently the chief. Matt was an M. And then he went on to work at Barclays in Kenya, where he saw the cross border money transfer use case. And, and then he got the idea of, of Remitly. And so he joined an incubator program called Techstars um, in Seattle. And at Techstars, Josh was Matt's mentor. And Josh, as I mentioned before, had previously. Uh, which was also one of the reasons Jeff Bezos was an early investor in Remitly. 
um, and so Josh mentored Matt, and Josh saw the idea of Remitly and really liked it, and so decided to found this company together. And what is nice is that they are two very different people with two very different skill sets. Uh, so Matt does a lot of the, the company presentations um, and is, is often the, the sort of external face of, of Remitly, whereas Josh is very heavily involved in the more analytical side um, and the day-to-day -day running of, of Remitly. So he's a very heavily analytical person um, who loves the detail, who loves the data and so on, whereas Matt is often the more sort of external face of the company, which for me is really nice and as they're still leading the company who have very complementary but also very different skill sets. Um, and so they're definitely not, not the same person. Yeah, so I was, uh, you already touched upon uh, a little bit about sort of your personal development and possibly the, of the other four people that stayed within the company till, till now. And I was wondering, um, because I think in, in I was wondering if you could give us examples of um, what sort of personal development did you had to do to, to sort of stay um, up, stay, stay up to date with the, with the company demands as it scaled? Did you had a mentor? Or did you just sort of Google it or did you just like, I don't know, was it a trial and error? Sure. And I'd say this is different from a personal development standpoint, but also from a progression standpoint. And I think the two are linked slightly. So if I look back to my, my time in consulting, uh, the tenure in each role is fairly clearly defined. Um, you could obviously be a superstar and, and go faster, um, but there were minimum tenure requirements and there were a set sort of job level at, at each, each grade. Um, and so you knew where you're likely to be in two years time, three years time, three years time. It's a very clearly defined career path. And then from a personal development standpoint, personal development, there were a lot of external training courses you could sign up to um, and, and a lot of of internal ones as well and it was something that was very very common and, and very uh commonly done and, and well understood and then when i when i started at remitly firstly the career development was was undefined um it was a, a generous role and a, and a company growing that quickly you don't know where the company is going to be in, in one year's time two years time and so on and, and so therefore it's very difficult to say how long you'll be in that role for and what your next role will be it's, it's much more fluid and much less clearly defined and then from a, a personal development standpoint, when I started, as far as I know, that there wasn't really much. Um, we had access to a website called Udemy, which gives online video courses, but there was no set time allocated to personal development. And in some ways, that's obviously a, a negative. Um, it, it's nice to have the time carved out because otherwise you, you often don't do it. Um, but what I would say is, is such a small company, you're working across all the different functions. And so you're not stuck in your own silo. You're actively working across marketing, pricing, product, customer service, risk, and so on. And these are all functions I, I didn't have any exposure to before. And so for me, that's where a lot of the development came from. And a lot of my understanding of, of the business is you are forced to become not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but at least have a, a base level understanding of all these different functions because you had to work across them. And so then as Remitly has grown as a company, that's when we built out a more formalized personal development time uh, with time explicitly carved out and, and there's funding available to interested external courses and so on. So it's becoming more like, I would imagine a corporate, um, but definitely at that very early stage, uh, there was nothing clearly defined, but you are working across the different functions, which for me gives a lot of development very, very quickly. Hello. And so I loved your point on, on culture, and I just wanted you to elaborate a little bit on that. Did you see any change in the culture as the company was growing? Do you think that there might be changes in culture, um, you know, post IPO? Is this going to affect the culture as it further grows? Uh, and how can a firm like that retain the culture as a competitive advantage when it grows and when it goes public? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, I, I think the core culture has stayed fairly consistent, surprisingly, considering how quickly the company has grown. And I think um, that's partly because of the focus from the founders all the way through the company from day one, uh, since they built Remitly and they realized what, what an important thing it was. I, I think it's also because of the mission of the company, um, because we are serving migrants. I, I think that generally attracts a certain kind of applicant. Um, and so that helps keep a, a largely consistent culture. With IPO and, and with the growth, um, I think there is a big danger that the culture changes. Um, and now we're a public company. If I was going back to my point before around equity is not commonly understood, at least in the UK, I don't think. And when it's a, a share option at a pre-IPO company, 
it's potentially not worth much um, or potentially worth, worth nothing. As a, as a public company, that value is very visible. And so you potentially get people who, who want to join you for your stock price, or want to join you for your equity rather than wanting to, to join the actual, the actual company. And then you layer on top of that the, the overall challenges of scaling so quickly across different across global um, different regions. And, and I think it ultimately still comes back to the, the core focus on culture. Um, I, I think that focus on culture has to be incredibly consistent amongst all of the leadership and also just every day really living and, and breathing that culture. Um, that means that when someone joins who, who doesn't necessarily embody some of those cultural values, um, it, it, it's fairly obvious fairly early on and, and, and you can rectify things. So, so I think a lot of it is just that day-to-day -day focus um, and, and keeping that consistency. Um, there is one more question online. Um, how do businesses perceive uh, ideas throughout uh, government transformations on the new tax jurisdictions that are crypto focused? For example, Bitcoin City, as proposed by President of El Salvador's Naib Bukele, uh, aims to have no taxes besides VAT taxes. And in June, the country passed a law to accept Bitcoin as a legal tender. Do you think they're ahead of the curve or of the reservation? I might pass on that question as I'm not a tax expert, unfortunately. Any more questions in the room? Okay. Sure, sorry. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, I guess one thing I just wanted to get your thoughts on is what could institutions and colleges do to just make sure that startup careers are an option and, you know, just to get the idea out there. So, so, so one of the things I, I struggled with a little bit at undergrad is, is it wasn't a clearly defined part. Um, so as I think I mentioned before, lots of people went into corporate level roles and graduate schemes. Very few people went on to startups. And then if I look to what we struggle with now at Revitly, uh, again, compared to consulting, consulting is very easy to, to recruit a lot of people. Everyone knows what consulting is. Lots of people want to go into strategy consulting. And so to recruit MBA students and graduates, you had sort of super days where you'd interview lots and lots of people and it was easy to recruit a lot of people. At Remitly, it's, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to find the right talent. Um, it's not a particularly well-known company, as, as a lot of startups obviously are. And so to, to find people who really know about you, really want to work for you, it, it's tough. And so one of the, the opportunities I, I really see is better links between universities and different startup companies, because I think both um, sides have a similar challenge. Universities, and there's no clearly defined path to go into startups, but also many startups will struggle for talent. Um, and so having a, a key link in with universities can, can help provide that bridge. And so I think opening up relationships with, with a number of different startups um, is something which, which could be incredibly helpful. There we go, there's a business idea for you guys. <laughs> um, and it's been amazing to get to know a bit more about the company you work for and everything you do, but just to get to know you a little bit more on a personal note, I just want to do a quick fire round with you. Sure. Um, so what was the last podcast you listened to? So it's not a, it's not a business podcast. Uh, I'm very into cars. Uh, so, uh, and he was interviewing Gordon Murray, uh, who designed a very famous McLaren supercar. Interesting. Okay, glad I asked the question. Did you pick up any lockdown habits? Coffee addiction. Uh, I start every day now with a cup of coffee, which I never had before. Fantastic. Um, do you prefer texting or talking? Talking. Talking. For voice notes or? No, you're not on not that level yet. Notes, no. no. <laughs> no just talking. <laughs> okay. Um, Obama's book, uh, Dreams from My Father. Uh, I never got around to it, so. Uh, it's fascinating to learn a little bit more about his work. Perfect. And my last question, what's your favourite movie? So I think it's more applicable to, to Oxford maybe than Cambridge, but Ooh. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, so that is my favourite trilogy. I think. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for your questions. And please do stick around um, if you'd like to speak to Diego. But yeah, thank you. round of applause.